Welcome to This Week in Linux. We've got another crazy amount of good news this week. The Raspberry Pi 5 has been announced, some important changes to the Linux kernel were announced, and the GNU project celebrated a big milestone of a 40 years anniversary. Plus, we'll take a look at a new distro offering from OpenSUSE. All of this and so much more on this episode of This Week in Linux, your source for Linux good news. This episode of Twill is sponsored by Linbit. More on them later. The Raspberry Pi is back and it has the new model of the Raspberry Pi 5 being announced from the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And this is coming at the end of October. So we are gonna have to wait a little bit to get our hands on it, but I am so excited to try one myself. It's been a while since I had a Raspberry Pi because the Raspberry Pi 4 was not really available for a long period of time, especially the eight gig model. Four gig model will be a $60 and the eight gig model will be $80. Now, they say that virtually every aspect of the platform has been upgraded which is kind of crazy because they also go on to say that over twice as fast as the Raspberry Pi 4, which the Raspberry Pi 4 was already impressive and it's been out for many years, but it's all, it was still an impressive device. And now that you can have one that's twice as fast, that's, that's awesome. And it has a 2.4 gigahertz quad core ARM CPU. It has a new GPU with the Video Core 7 GPU. It has support for displays of two 4K 60 HDMI displays. That's just awesome for this small device to be able to do that. It has support for Bluetooth 5, Bluetooth Low Energy. It also has high-speed micro SD card interface with SDR 104 mode support. It has two USB 3 ports, which you can support simultaneously using five gigabytes of operation through, which is just awesome. And they're gigabits per second, actually. Gigabit ethernet with power over ethernet support and so much more, including the ever desired 40 pin GPIO headers. Those are staying in addition to the new power button, which doesn't seem like a lot, but if you've ever used a Raspberry Pi, the power button is something that you've multiple times well, wish you had and now there is one so that is awesome now there's a lot more stuff to talk about with this particular topic but we're going to save that for destination linux because we covered this in much more depth in the next episode of destination linux so be sure to subscribe to the destination linux podcast you can go to destinationlinux.net to find out how to do that and the next very next episode in like a day or so is going to have that conversation. So be sure to check that out. And in the meantime, you'll find links in the show notes for more about the Raspberry Pi 5. This week at the Open Source Summit in Europe, there were some changes announced to the support model for LTS kernels, long-term support, where it will go from six years of support down to just two years. Jonathan Corbett, a Linux kernel developer, made this announcement stating that not many people were using or taking advantage of these six years of support. And the biggest issue is that it's a pain to maintain for six years. Corbett goes on to mention that developers are also burning out while they still have 2,000 programmers for the kernel, which includes about 200 new developers for this latest series of kernels. The maintainers who test all of this code are struggling to keep up with all the various testing needed included for these kernels with six years of support. And it makes a lot of sense because the kernel for six years, most people don't even use the two-year-old kernel, much less the six-year-old kernel. So sometimes that may be depending on the industry, there may be some differences there, but for the vast majority of people are not gonna be affected by this. And even if they are going to be affected a little bit, the distros that they use are more than likely going to cover some changes and maintenance for that as well. So it probably isn't that big of a deal. But if you'd like to learn more, this was just a brief look at the news and my take on it, but there's a lot more to this story. So check out the links in the show notes for more information about that. And also you'll find a link in there for the next episode of Destination Linux, Destination Linux 341, where we talk about this topic in much more depth. So be sure to check that out. Links in the show notes. This week marked a milestone anniversary for a very important project and movement that arguably inspired, well, the so many great things that came after it. This week, the GNU project celebrated its 40th anniversary. In 1983, the GNU project was announced the goal to create an operating system consisting entirely of free software to allow people to use, understand, adapt, and share software. 
And thanks to GNU and the FSF, there were a lot of really important things that came from it. The GPL was made to offer a legal structure for developers to open their source code to the world while also ensuring that those who use that source code would be having to provide their own code be licensed with the GPL. This changed a lot for the software world and made it possible for so many projects to thrive. And despite all the controversies around GNU and those who lead it, the impact GNU has had is undeniable for sure. I'm not a fan of the term free software, but the movement to ensure software freedom was a very important one, and I'm thankful that it was done. If you would like to learn more about this and the GNU project, you can find links in the show notes for more. This episode of Twill is brought to you by Linbit. Linbit has been keeping digital businesses running for over 20 years. They're the makers of open source products like DRBD, which is high availability software that has been part of the Linux kernel since 2010, and Linstore, industry-leading open source software-defined storage. Linbit has an active presence in the open source community as well because they collaborate with the community to help identify and build new features to their products. Linbit provides enterprise-grade software that runs on a variety of platforms without vendor lock-in, which is really cool because no matter what your OS is and no matter what kind of hardware you want to use, including off-the-shelf hardware, you're good to go with DRBD and Linstore. And also with DRBD and Linstore, you can have high-speed replicated block storage in almost any configuration, whether it's Kubernetes, Apache Cloud, or Open Nebula. There's even DRBD proxy for long-distance replication. Linbit provides really awesome services like DRBD, and DRBD is a really good way to make sure you have good data recovery and backups. And if you ever have like a cluster with multiple nodes and one of those nodes fa fails, you can have rest assurance that the backup nodes will have the data that you want. So if you're interested in checking out any of the software from Linbit, I highly recommend it. So go to linbit.com to check it out. That's L-I-N-B-I-T dot com. OpenSUSE is in the news this week with their new experimental distribution called Slow Roll. Slow Roll is based on Tumbleweed, but it rolls much slower, which makes sense. Tumbleweed rolls updates out every one to two days, and Slow Roll does this process every one to two months, but also will include bug fixes and CVE fixes if they come in during that period of time to get, make sure that those things are added as soon as possible. Now, they also recently published an OpenSUSE survey asking IT professionals and users about their views on open source technologies and the ever-evolving Linux ecosystem. And in my response to the survey, I would say I like the idea of slow roll because I think that sometimes rolling releases are a bit too much and slow roll sounds like a good alternative, like kind of like a hybrid approach. So that's pretty cool. Now, if you would like to take the survey, which is actually not about slow roll, I just wanted to put that in there. You can find a link in the show notes. But the way that the survey is designed, there's four different themes. It has uh, 30 questions. And there's only one question that's mandatory, which is the first one, so you can skip whatever you want. But there's four different themes of questions for understanding user needs and satisfaction, home and hobby enthusiasts, contributions and open source involvement, and as well as general insights and future trends. So if you'd like to take the survey or learn more, more about the slow roll distribution, you can find links in the show notes. Mozilla has announced the release of Firefox 118. Now, some of the highlights for this release is that there are 10 new CSS math functions supported. Also, font fingerprinting protection has been added in the private browsing mode. And the biggest new feature is now supports the automated translation of web content built right inside the browser. And this is not just any kind of lit translation or localization as some refer to it as. This is not cloud-based. So if you would look at the Google Chrome browser, you could do this there too, but it would be using Google's translation system on the cloud. This is actually using it local translations on your computer, which means you have privacy about what it's translating and also it works offline. So if you're not online for any given reason, it would still work, which is awesome. We talked about this in episode 232, I think, when we covered the Firefox 117, but that feature wasn't involved in that particular release. It, it seemed like it was, but they pulled it back at the last minute. This is a release that it does have it, and I'm also looking forward to the next release of 119 because there are reports that you'll be able to use some Google Chrome extensions inside of Firefox, and that sounds crazy cool. So... Be sure to subscribe to This Week in Linux for more information about this topic and so much more. And if you'd like to learn more about the latest release of Firefox 118 or to get it for yourself, 
You can check the links in the show notes. The Linux Mint team have announced the full release of the sixth edition of their Debian-based distribution with Linux Mint Debian Edition 6. This is powered by Debian 12 Bookworm, which is similar to Linux Mint 21.2, practically identical other than the fact that one's Ubuntu and one's Debian-based. They have Cinnamon 5.8, touchpad gesture support, resizable Mint menu, redesigned software manager, support for HEIF and AVIF images, and much more. But you might be wondering, what's the point of two different Linux Mints? Well, that's a fair question, and it has been answered on the Linux Mint website, although this answer needs to be updated in my opinion. It says the goal is to ensure Linux Mint can continue to deliver the same user experience if Ubuntu was ever to disappear. It allows us to assess how much we depend on Ubuntu and how much work would be involved in such an event. So, The reason I'm saying this needs to be updated is because that's a message that's been there for years, and the Linux Mint Debian Edition has been a project that they have been working on for almost a decade. I think they should know how much work is involved by now. So I'm curious, why do they still have it? And if it's the same reason, how long will it take to know how much effort is involved? (laughs) Anyway, if you'd like to check it out, Linux Mint Debian Edition or LMDE6, you'll find links in the show notes. Google has announced that they are extending the lifespan for the support of their Chromebooks to 10 years. In fact, this applies to all Chromebooks, not just new Chromebooks. Officially, Google and Chromebook vendors only support them until their auto update expiration, AUE date, that used to be three to five years, and then it became up to eight years for models launched in 2020 or later. But now, according to a Wall Street Journal report, Google is now supporting all Chromebooks for 10 years. So if it was before 2020, and it's still going to be supported for many more years to come. So that is very cool. This seems to be in response to growing school administrative concerns about Chromebook's limited lifespan. Google is significantly extending the support for this because of that seemingly. Now, I think this is a really interesting thing because Chromebooks are very much in the education space and they are very good for that because you can hand a kid a Chromebook and not worry about it because it's not a super expensive device. And also the fact that the stuff is not stored there, it's stored in the cloud. It makes sense because then they could just use whichever Chromebook you give them. And it's a pretty cool idea. Now, I wish there was a full Linux layout of different educational purposes for the various different distros in these educational institutions. That would be ideal. But Chromebooks are technically Linux-based, so that's cool too. (laughs) If you'd like to learn more about this news, you'll find links in the show notes. The KDE Project are known for their Plasma desktop, and they're working on a new version of that desktop with Plasma 6 that is expected to come out at the end of February 2024. So in just four months from now, we're going to be able to get a new massive change to KDE Plasma 6, so I am super excited about that. And if you would like to help the development, you can participate in the fundraiser they're doing right now for KDE Plasma 6. And on the fundraiser page, they have a countdown for the release. No, it it says 152 days from now, more or less, because it's a tentative date and it might not happen exactly on that date. But I also like the fact that if it is going to be that date, it's planned for a release on February 29th, Leap Day, so that's pretty cool. They also talk about what this money is gonna be used for for the fundraiser. They talk about sprints for developers, uh, travel costs to events, the Academy event itself, running KDE in general, and others. And I think this is really good, and their goal is not super crazy. They only wanna get 500 new supporters to the project, and I think this is definitely doable. So if you would like to participate and be one of those new supporters, you can find links in the show notes for the KDE Plasma 6 fundraiser landing page. The Porteous development team have announced the release of Porteous 5.01. This release comes with Linux kernel 6.5. And for those who are unfamiliar with Porteous, it is based on Slackware. And in this particular case, it is based on Slackware 15.0. Plus it also has updates from Slackware 15.0 patches repository and it has support for both 32-bit and 64-bit, and it has options with eight different desktops. Those options include KDE, LXQt, Mate, Cinnamon, Gnome, LXDE, OpenBox, and XFCE. Although there might be a typo, because based on my research, I found the KDE references says KDE4, and that can't be right, is it? I'm not sure. 
I didn't have time to test it myself, but I'm very curious. So if you know, please let me know in the comments. But if you'd like to learn more about the latest release of Porteus 5.01, you'll find links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show and want to be kept up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, then be sure to subscribe. And of course, remember to like that smash button. If you'd like to support the show and the Tux Digital Network, then consider becoming a patron by going to tuxdigital.com slash membership, where you can get a bunch of cool perks like access to patron-only sections of our Discord server and much, much more. You can also support the show by ordering the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt or the This Week in Linux shirt at tuxdigital.com slash store. Plus, while you're there, check out all the other cool stuff we have like hats, mugs, hoodies, stickers, coasters, and just so much at tuxdigital.com slash store. I'll see you next time for another episode of Your Source for Linux Canoes. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell, and I hope you're doing swell. Be sure to ring the notification bell. And until next time, I bid you farewell.